morning and welcome to day two of ICS Montreal. Je vous souhaite tous la bienvenue encore. J'espère qu'hier vous a plu. Today we have an exciting program. We want to kick off the day with one of our innovations here for Montreal 2015. Dr. Chris Chappell has been kind enough to step forward to give us an update on 2015, looking back at the year, what's been published, what have people done differently, how can the year's learning change our research and practice. You'll probably agree with me that Dr. Chappell is, I consider, an expert and perhaps the best position to give this update. As editor-in-chief of the Journal of Neurourology and Neurodynamics for how many years now? Uh, he's been working on the journal for a good decade, I believe. Um, as Secretary General of the European Association of Urology, having chaired the guidelines initiative, the NICE Guidelines Development Group on Male Urinary Tract Symptoms, and having won the St. Peter's Medal by the British Urological Association of, Uro of Urological Surgeons a few years ago. He continues to act in his capacity as a consultant urological surgeon uh, in Sheffield, and perhaps most impressively, he has authored or co-authored over 350 articles in the field of urology over the course of his career. I hope you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Chappell. Thank you, Cara. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to say I'm not sure I can live up to any of those expectations that you've kindly put upon me, and I'm very honored and delighted for this invitation, although I found this to be one of the most challenging things I've ever done, because trying to think of the five papers that have changed practice is very, very difficult, where one's talking about an evolution of practice in anything to do with clinical science. And so really, I think I was, what I decided to do was to look at the topics, of course, including papers, which were likely to be relevant and topical. Obviously, I have some disclosures, which most people are aware of. And the first thing is really, as a urologist, dealing with functional urology, which I've done all of my career, I always feel a bit like this with my oncological colleagues, particularly having been involved in taking over a large organization where oncology rules. But I would suggest that certainly, as I'm sure we'd all agree at the ICS, that with functional disorders, and with the fact that with a functional disorder, you're talking about degeneration of the neural system as well as the peripheral structures and changes which are potentially very significant, it's unlikely there'll be any quick fix, which with oncology there may be with new chemicals and with uh, various forms of ablation and so on. So really the topics I was thinking of was about the um, assessment of urethral function uh, we, we have a lot of talk about abdominal leak point pressures, and certainly in some parts of the world they're routinely used. But really, how effective are we with these? Can we improve conservative management and its applications? And I've just chosen a couple of topics within that area. What is the role of synthetic tapes? Another very topical issue at the moment, where there's an enormous amount of hype and where one has to really look objectively at what we know and what we don't know and what the latest evidence is. The underactive bladder, again, a lot of hype over this. Everybody wanting to get on the latest bandwagon, which inevitably is what one always sees in clinical science. And neural reconstruction, an area which, as urologists and urogynecologists, we don't know that much about. But if you look at the um, neurosurgical literature, clearly there's been some uh, progress and development and interest. So, what about the leak point pressures and stress urine incontinence? What I have done, given the title of 2015, is to rely upon reviews to a significant extent, up-to-date reviews. And here's one which I commissioned in the context of current opinions in urology. And who better than Paul Abrams and others to, to look at this, the leak point pressure? And really, if when you go into the evidence base relating to it, although we glibly talk about abdominal leak point pressures, do we actually know um, what bladder capacity we should be looking at? What volume, really? Really, what size catheter we should be using? What is the baseline for measurement on the urodynamic trace? And that's not as easy, of course, as it sounds. How to measure the exact point, really? And, of course, how well does it uh, correlate with outcome. And we know from the year, over the years, that 
the, the much used phrase that a low pressure urethra may not leak if there's kinking and a high pressure one may and it may, doesn't always predict outcome. There's a whole spread of literature on this subject. Indeed, if you look at this from the Bristol group, from their article, you can see it's very difficult to pinpoint the, the actual pressure at which leakage occurs. And they concluded that standardization of urodynamics according to good urological practice clearly is important, and the ICS has been the major lead in doing that. The truths of leak point pressures clearly are important, but the Maguire pressure that's been taken of 30 to 40 or whatever is not an absolute. In any patient with a neurological disease process, you really need to think of a raised pressure and take it very seriously in the longer term. And of course, there's not as yet any um, consensus on how to uh, look at the abdominal leak point pressure. So really, are they useful at all, apart from in some countries where for reimbursement purposes they're used? Do they actually predict outcome? Or should we be using more of a global assessment, which is what the ICS has always suggested? So take-home messages is, of course, to true the leak point pressure in neuropaths is important. And when we're talking about the pre predictive methods for defining urethral function, they've all got their pros and cons, but probably video urodynamics is the easiest to use. Pressure profilometry, although there are a number of advocates for this, is not a particularly pleasant for the patient, and indeed, if you actually look at the efficacy of it in terms of predicting outcome within an individual unit, it's a very effective technique, but between units, based on individual practice, it may not be. And so certainly we need, for the future now, in 2015, really seriously to try and find new ways of predicting the urethral function. And that's something which needs to be addressed. It's not a very topical issue, although it comes up, and at the end of the day, it's rather salutary after 40 years in this association that we really need to focus on that. So can we improve conservative management? Now, we're all familiar with the importance of the pelvic floor, and the great thing about the ICS as a multidisciplinary association is the fact that many colleagues present actually are the real experts on it, our colleagues in physiotherapy. Of course, we all recognize the importance of the support mechanisms, and in this context, it's well recognized that physiotherapy is a very effective technique. Electrical stimulation certainly can be utilized, but the evidence base for that's limited because all the machines and stimulation parameters are different. And of course, biofeedback is essential. Now, Carrie Bowes worked in this area for many years, and this is from Neurology Urodynamics. The key point was, in experienced hands like hers, you can get good long-term results. But many of us in clinical practice find that that is not as easy to achieve because of the variability of practice, the pressure on the practice, and the way in which people aren't always able to spend huge amounts of time with patients. And so there was an interesting publication which was looking at the subject of the physiotherapy using appropriate communication with patients using the internet. And I thought this was an interesting publication. It wasn't in 2015, but it's very recent. And they randomized patients to having a questionnaire or actually having a program on the internet and looked at how this could be used after the initial, I would suggest here that it would be initial assessment and instruction of the patient and then to actually advise them how to continue with that. And they found that overall, just looking at the literature that they produced, compared with the postal group, there was more participants in the internet group who had a positive outcome, and they've suggested that for the future. So really, the quality of life was better improved using that, and overall, nearly 70% of the patients reported complete or partial significantly increased more than 50% improvement in continence with that approach. So really, physiotherapy, we would all agree, is effective. We do need to have patient motivation, and I know everybody here would agree with that, Electrical stimulation maybe more uh, should be applied to actually trying to standardize this. We keep talking about it, and no doubt this will be described at the ICUD next year, that we ha use this, but we can't actually comment because there's no evidence base. And at the end of the day, you need comp patient compliance. Overactive bladder obviously came out of the ICS as a concept, much criticized because it's a non-specific symptom complex, not a condition, but clearly important with increasing age. There's been a lot of interest, of course, in various techniques. One that came to the fore a few years ago was PTNS, 
And at the end of the day, this is one which has also been very poorly researched with very limited long-term follow-up, only one study properly out to three months. And where certainly this is an area where there could be great developments using stimulation of peripheral nerves, not only transcutaneously, but also percutaneously, uh, sorry, not only percutaneously, but transcutaneously. So this has been assessed again in another review, along with the other techniques such as botulinum toxin and in this context, sacral neuromodulation. And they concluded that these are third line therapies, none of us would disagree. The available evidence is limited because there's no comparison between them, but the perception is that uh, tibial nerve stimulation is less effective than either of the other two techniques. And in the case of overactive bladder, or those with detrusive overactivity with overactive bladder, that we do need to have a better outcome data for the future, and we need further research to identify the appropriate patient. If you actually look at tibial nerve stimulation, which has been very trendy in many people's hands, the question is, what parameters have, do you use? And nobody's effectively looked at the parameters, to my knowledge. There was a device a, f a couple of years ago which had a brief foray talking about the TAMS waveform, but if you actually looked at it, it was nonsense. Uh, so uh, at the end of the day, our colleagues working in physics and so on need to advise on this, and we need to look at more effective techniques. We need to think of the site of stimulation, and we need to have long-term data which we don't have in the literature, and things are marketed at present without any long-term data. And indeed, if you talk about this technique, you're talking about a cost of at least $500 a month when you take account of the clinic visit. So is this realistic uh, for an approach which is maybe slightly better than drug therapy and where we don't have long-term data? I'd ask you that as a question for the future. So we do need to have proper randomized studies which aren't faulted in their design, and the existing studies looking at these techniques do have a number of faults when you go into them with a bias which will always predict the outcome to some extent. What about looking at the subject of stress urine incontinence and tapes and treatment relating to tapes? Peggy Norton produced this many years ago at the ICS as a concept where you're talking about support to the bladder, the bladder being the ship, and of course the support mechanisms being the water there in the dry dock, which would be the uh, pelvic support, and also the ligaments, the guy ropes. And obviously the principle is if you lose your pelvic support, then of course you put pressure on the ligaments and then ev eventually those may start to not be sufficient. And that sort of led on to the whole principle of the TVT and the lookalikes, which came along suggesting that you could produce a ligamentous support, although personally I think you're talking about a backplate for the urethra uh, to actually support it rather than reproducing the appropriate ligaments. And in this context, as you're all aware, this is what we've seen. There was one study, the Ward Hilton study, originally designed as a five-year study, but because it was successful, the sponsoring organization made it a two-year study and then dropped the follow-up. And based on that, and that one paper alone, because that's all they needed to get regulatory approval from the notified bodies, they were then able to move forward with, the, with the, what we've seen. And you've seen this develop over the years with no evidence base. The other question I'd ask is, has anybody actually ever looked at the material that we use? The answer, if you look at the literature, is no. It was used because it came from the Liechtenstein hernia repair, and it was available, and it was approved by the regulatory bodies. So if you actually then look at the situation, that's what's developed, and we're familiar with the current um, platform that we have, and of course, mini slings have come along as well. So looking at a review of mini slings, and this has also been reviewed by the Cochrane review process, and this is again from 2015 from the current opinions group, you can see that there's a huge number of mini slings. Now, isn't that a rather salutary thing, that these have been introduced with no evidence base again, not having learnt the lessons of the other slings. And that's, of course, what we've all seen. And, of course, they're minimally invasive and they're effective, and this is what I've taken from their paper. I know there's too much to read on there, but the point is that this is a conclusion. And if you actually look at it, for instance, with the TVT Secure, that's what we saw within a year coming out of France. And, of course, in some countries that was withdrawn from use. You then look at the evidence base, and, again, a good groups involved here. But again, if you look at it, less than 100 patients. Is that realistic when we're talking about thousands being implanted? So really, 
if you actually look at the literature, the single incision mini slings have not yet proven their non inferiority concern compared to others. There are very many different types of mini sling. The major advantage, of course, is that they're minimally invasive. The disadvantage is they may not work as well. And of course, again, the materials are the same materials as before. And there's no long term data that's yet been available in an effective randomized fashion outside small company sponsored um, group, uh, sort of productions. So, in this context, we need to also think about the management of mesh complications. Now, this again is a very emotive issue. In some countries, there's a feeding frenzy over the medical legal side which has become a little bit out of control, and people don't always rationalize it between the surface area of the mesh, as in other words, for prolapse, and for stress urine incontinence. So let's look at where we are in 2015. Now, we know from the ALHAT study, which is a randomized study in the past of TVT against TOT, that basically what you had here was a situation that about 4% of patients at the end of two years, between in expert centers, had significant complications with these procedures. And of course, that's a very relevant figure because that also came out, to, uh, out of a not, a, not an effective, but a, a follow-up of the five-year data from the Ward Hilton study, which came out with a figure about the same. Again, expert centers. And so it's to be borne in mind that we do know that. We do know that with anything you put in, that there can be compression. And of course, if there's compression, you'll get voiding difficulty and you may need to actually uh, cut that to relieve the situation. Of course, exposure of mesh, uh, when it occurs vaginally, is usually related to surgical factors within the first six weeks, where the vagina vascularity has been affected during the surgical dissection. But later on, there may be other reasons. And of course, this has led on also to the complications which many of us see. I think, again, we need as an association and as organizations dealing with this area to take an effective look at how to manage this because all too many people try and manage their complications where they may not have huge numbers that they're familiar with. And I see situations where people are using lasers and doing endoscopic work and then the patients effectually are referred on uh, with a situation which may have been made co more complex by a limited attempt to try and excise a material which usually is going full thickness through the, the urethra or the bladder. And in that context, if you're talking about an organ erosion, then it's a significant problem. And if you look at the literature, this, in, of course, from the review paper, includes both mesh for um, prolapse and stress union incontinence. But the point is the number of different complications, whether dyspyunia, the urinary tract symptoms, a pain continuing, and infection. And at the end of the day, the success rate, as you can see there, many of these uh, studies have got limited numbers of patients relatively, and there's been no adequate reporting in the worldwide literature. We, we don't know the denominator in any studies which have looked at real life practice, and it's very likely in the European community that within the next 18 months, with the new legislation that's going through the parliament at present, we will have to have mandatory databases, very much as we're used for orthopedics with the hip implants which picked up the metal on metal problem which many of you may be familiar with. So for the future, that's important. The management of mesh complications clearly needs to be carried out effectively by people with experience in reconstructive urology, whether they are urogynecologists or urologists, and that needs to be mandated by our associations. Chronic pelvic pain and dyspyunia, of course, are issues which we all see in a limited number of patients. And the assessment tools we have, of course, the ICS collaborated with IUGA in a classification of complications, but that needs to be re-evaluated. And we need to have full disclosure of the risks and benefits, as we all appreciate as associations, to our patients. Last week, as you may know, the Scottish about 18 months ago, a year to 18 months ago, had a little foray into this area, which was led by politicians, who then came out suggesting that mesh shouldn't be routinely used although the MHRA, the regulatory body in the UK, didn't actually say that. It was misinterpreted. And last week, a report came out from the Scottish Government, uh, which is on the web, which you may want to look at, which is very interesting. Because they had full access to, in the, uh, in the UK, of course, the National Health Service, and particularly in Scotland, is very well organized, and they can pull out data, which is not always totally accurate, but does look at the number of patients who've been treated.
and you can see there they were able to look at a time scale. So the, to the far left over here you can see Kolper suspension, you can see the genesis of tapes coming in and Kolper suspension disappearing with the numbers of patients treated. And you can see that if you look at the data set, in terms of immediate complications, readmissions for later complications, and readmissions for further incontinence or prolapse surgery. It's quite salutary, although we've seen bulking agents being used with many people advocating their use and coming along, that in terms of cost and readmissions and reoperation, it's very significant, isn't it? In other words, they don't work very well. We use them in the very elderly or the very young, but if you use them for anything else, you're probably wasting your time. If you're actually then looking at open culprit suspension, this is the uh, data set. And if you then look at superubic autologous slings and unspecified tapes and tapes, you can see the platform, which is quite interesting data, I think, because I'm not aware of this coming out from any other papers that we've seen, because they always have limited numbers. This is quite a complex slide, which I'll work you, walk you through. Open culpa suspension has been used as a standard for the past and they're looking at immediate complications, readmission for later complications within five years, and readmission for further incontinence or prolapse surgery within five years. And if you look here, this is the autologous slings. If something is below the line or green, you can see it's beneficial above, it's, it's, it's a negative factor, and this is numbers per thousand uh, patients treated. And you can see here that bulking agents uh, sorry, superubic slings, this is the autologous slings, certainly uh, you can see that, that there is a significant uh, factor there, clearly. Uh, that's using traditional slings largely, not the mini autologous slings put in loosely mid-urethral. And if you look at urethral injections, again it stars as not being that effective, and if you look at slings, not too bad uh, using the synthetic slings. The mini sling using autologous fascia is something that I think people need to take account of and you need to offer this to your patients as an alternative to synthetic material. It can be put in mid-urethral and it can be put in loosely with a minimal uh, dissection necessary. If you look at data relating to that, this is 10 year follow-up of a study run from Wales by the group there uh, from Malcolm Lucas and you can see interestingly the study looked at um, the use of pelvicol and you looked at TVT and autologous fascia, and interestingly, autologous fascia at 10 years seemed to be as good as TVT, if not slightly better, although this is certainly not powered to make such conclusions. We had to drop the pelvic hole data set at six months, and were criticized heavily at the time because they didn't actually work, and we know you get a T-cell response, so all these materials don't survive. If you actually look, then, polypropylene for the future, you look at the laboratory data with this, and you see that the material becomes like a cheese wire within a week of continuous tension. So we need new materials if we're going to use synthetic agents. There are new materials, there are many materials that the material sciences have out there which we could use. We know and we've learned the hard way as surgeons and in this area that xenografts and allografts don't work. We've seen that with cadaveric tissue, we've seen it with porcine tissue because you get a T-cell response. And many of us who've reoperated on patients don't find much of a scar. It's all been absorbed, and that's the reason why. Autologous tissue is self-tissue. So you're putting in your own matrix in your own cells. It's tissue engineering, like cutting yourself is a form of crude tissue engineering. So you get the tissue actually picking up a blood supply, and you get fibrosis, you get the fibroblasts growing and proliferating. And so certainly we don't have an ideal approach, but for the future we need to look at new approaches. Mini slings are effective in expert hands in some cases, but they're not the standard of care. Synthetic tapes have had a lot of bad press, but I think the evidence would suggest they're not that bad in experienced hands, provided that you've actually counseled your patient appropriately, and that's the key point. And so certainly we should continue the search for alternative approaches we should look at new biomaterials and we should continue with the search for appropriate, cost-effective and feasible tissue engineering approaches to the subject. In this context, talking about tissue engineering, of course there's been a lot of enthusiasm about injecting cells into the urethra. And of course we appreciate that when you're talking about stress urine incontinence, there's a combination of intrinsic sphincter deficiency and hypermobility. And of course, if you look at patients, there's a combination of both at different levels in the patient population. And of course, as we can't 
effectively look at urethral function? We don't know, do we? We actually work it on the basis that we can identify it based on clinical impression. And so it goes on. This has led, of course, on to the innovative approach, which came out of Innsbruck, looking at the use of stem cells from skeletal muscle. The interesting thing was they were using ultrasound to very accurately inject into the urethra in an appropriate position, but as you know, there were some issues which led to that work discontinuing. If you actually look at the scientists who've worked in this area about stem cells, of course they've used animal models. But another area to discuss is really there aren't any animal models for stress urinary incontinence because no mice, rats, rabbits or anything else walk around on their back legs and, spend, and live 65 or 70 or 80 years. So at the end of the day, we don't have adequate models. We can grow tissue in models, but we don't know how that relates to the human situation. And really, they emphasize the fact that in future, we need to look at selecting the most uh, significant approach, creating a long-term clinically relevant animal model, which I don't think is probably going to be feasible, and restricting the feasibility of this and looking into it further. So this leads on to the use of stem cell injection, which is continuing. And if you look at the recent paper that came from Chancellor and colleagues, certainly they showed in a small number of patients using two doses, both low dose and high dose, and looking at uh, patients who had, as you can see, a more than 50% improvement or rendered dry. And this is clever because this is part of that population. You can see that there was a significant benefit they found and improvements in quality of life. But as a caveat, Although they suggested that there was a benefit with higher doses, they, one has to actually ask oneself what one's dealing with. If you inject cells, we've already seen that bulking agents have limited benefit. So the next question is, as I've already mentioned, some patients have intrinsic sphincter deficiency, which we all know is due to pudendal nerve denervation. So if you inject cells, and there isn't an innovation in some patients, or an inadequate innovation, how are those cells going to be innovated? That's a question I've never heard anybody adequately address when talking about this. The second thing is, if you inject cells, and the cells actually are innovated, fair enough, how are you going to get functional innovation with the right part of the brain to allow them to work? Again, nobody's addressed this. There's been a lot of hype about injecting stem cells and every rushing off to try and get onto this little bandwagon, but do, is it actually feasible? Somebody needs to prove that, to do some basic science work to show you get innovation, which should be feasible, to actually show that there would be a benefit from doing this, otherwise it's just a form of bulking agent. So cell injection into the sphincter it has a number of these questions. The placement of the cells, the innovation, and the adequate incorporation into the voiding reflex. We do need to have proper randomized data before it's introduced. As a urologist, of course, I deal with male patients and with the interest in oncology and radical prostatectomy, incontinence is an issue. Just briefly, because I realize a lot of the audience may not be particularly interested in this, artificial sphincters have been used for many years, quadratic slings, and the slings which are placed under the urethra with or without bone anchors have been used. If you look at the literature rating, this again from a 2015 review by Cometer, you can see that artificial sphincters are effective. Slings, according to the existing literature, are less effective, but you can see there is, of course, complications with erosion and infection. Not particularly significant, but we have mature data for slings, so we know a more realistic figure, sorry, for artificial sphincters, so we know a more realistic figure than certainly for slings. And of course, if you look at the indications, in the past, artificial sphincters have been used for the more severe cases, with mild to moderate being treated by slings. There is, of course, uh, a literature relating to this, and this is the review from Cometa, suggesting that, of course, you, you can use all of these techniques and that adequate sling tension, if you're using a sling, needs to be applied. But again, there's no guidelines for that. And if you look at different studies, there's different tension applied. So different sling designs have been used, and I think most people have gone away from bone anchors and putting in too much mesh, and maybe the quadratic ones will not survive for that reason, because the more mesh there, the more likelihood of potential complications. And you, we need to look at the which patients for which treatment, and certainly there's a randomized study underway at the UK looking at this, although uh, it'll be interesting to see what the data shows. The underactive bladder is another area where there's a lot of interest, and we all go back to the paper of Resnick and Yala, 
And we mustn't forget that we talk about DHIC, but it's, it, it, it's an impaired contractility. It's a relative thing. And in that paper, there are a lot of degrees of impairment. It wasn't absolute. If you actually then look at possible definitions, one published recently, and the data coming out of Bristol, talking about, from a retrospective analysis, which questions to ask. The question is, can you actually define underactive bladder symptomatically? Because you get both storage, voiding, and post nutrition symptoms. And it may well be that you can't, because at the end of the day, the underactive bladder symptom complex is based on a urodynamic diagnosis of detrusor underactivity, which can only be shown urodynamically. So there is a, random, there is a com committee in the ICS currently looking at this, which will come up with deliberations in the not too distant future for being transmitted to the membership for an opinion to be passed. Lastly, neural reconstruction is an area where we can look at the lonely tract. And we're all familiar with the complexity of the neural structures. And we know that in the past, the, the Brindley stimulator was used to stimulate in spinal cord injury patients. If you look at the review which came out recently from the neurosurgical literature in 2015, it was an area which I knew nothing about. And certainly, it was fascinating to see that in experimental studies, the neurosurgeons have been carrying out many different approaches in animal models to reconnect tissues uh, by rejoining the nerves. And certainly, they had some limited results, successful results, which may come into clinical practice, but of course there's been abortive attempts in the past, and there was one from colleagues in China. Having said that, there are all these different approaches, both intradural, extradural, joining up peripheral and central nerves, in a re-innovating the bladder directly using nerves, and these are areas which we need to look at in the future, particularly in our spinal cord injury patients. One area which has had some benefit in humans, although not absolute, has been to use a, 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 a innovation of the skin to produce a sensitive area of the skin which in neuropaths you could stimulate to help bladder emptying. And the literature on that has suggested some, some results which are positive, but in, in the long run, the data has not been completely supported by others. And like all of these innovations, you need to look at this objectively for the future. Certainly the Brindley stimulator works as long as you uh, carry out a deaffrontation of the low unit tract, and we do need to look at this in the future. We're only just beginning to understand neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, and pharmacology, and so the future, this is where we stand at present. Perfect timing. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that really stimulated reflection, that was quite the update, had us looking back but also forward about ways we should change our research and practice to evolve to the, I guess, growing evolution of the field.